Good morning. Looks like Sully's ready and I'm ready and Scout's here and you're ready. So we're going to continue talking about the causes of World War I and today we're going to look at the region known as the Balkans. We're going to go back in time and, and start a little bit further back. Let me share my screen with my mad skills here. And click. And there. There we go. And we have to start out by talking about the Ottoman Empire. Now, when we talk about the Ottoman Empire, this is not what I used to picture when I was sitting in school and they would talk about the Ottoman Empire and they didn't really explain it. I always thought it meant those footstools that you have that you put in front of chairs that you put your feet on. Those are called Ottomans. And I think they originated in this part of the country, but it doesn't mean that that's what they did was just sit around and put their feet on these Ottomans all day long. That's not really what happened. That's just the picture I had in my head. Get a different picture in your head. It's not right. People look at you funny. The Ottoman Empire was what we now refer to as Turkey. And Turkey is really a country. I had a kid try to explain to me that Turkey's not a country. Turkey's what you eat at Thanksgiving. That is true. But Turkey's also a country. And Turkey is sort of unique in that part of it is in Europe and part of it is in Asia. And it, it crosses over there still today. Uh, it, it's kind of an, an interesting country. But back in the time period that we're talking about, it was the rulers of what was called the Ottoman Empire. And if you look at this map, everything that you see here that's not in the kind of cream color, all of the color colors, all of that was part of the Ottoman Empire. It was huge. It came to power, they came to power, started taking over uh, stuff in the 17th century. That would be the 1600s. They controlled vast, vast areas of land and huge populations of people that were not Turkish or not, you know, from, you know, lived in that area. They controlled other different nationalities, which tends to become a problem. But they began to have a decline in their military power in the 19th century. Um, in 1829, the nation of Greece won its independence, and then pretty rapidly, the nations of Serbia and Bulgaria followed suit. And the Ottoman Empire, by the time that we're talking about in the early 1900s especially, became known as the sick old man of Europe because it was basically like a toothless old guy that still controlled everything but didn't really have the military power to back it up and if anybody challenged them they were going to lose so that's that's where we are right now austria hungary was another empire and they controlled everything that you see here in these colors and they're right here right next to germany because you know we talked about austria hungary when we talked about germany um, and they controlled an area that was inhabited by 11 different nationalities. And that's what this map is actually showing you, all of the, the little different colors. Each one of those is a different nationality that's controlled by this one empire that's run by the Austrians, who are German, basically, and the Hungarians, who are basically Slavic. And they kind of joined together and they're trying to grab all these other people in. There was an upsurge in nationalism, and nationalism is the belief that people who are of the same nationality should be in the same country together, and they should control their own fate and be an independent state. Um, the emperor, emperor of uh, the Austro-Hungarian, Hung I mean, I can't even talk this morning. The Austro-Hungarian Empire. His name was Franz Joseph, and he was determined to stamp out nationalism and keep this from becoming an issue in his empire because it could break up his empire, and he was not going to have that. So after the Franco-Prussian War ended in 1871, we talked about that last time, alliances began to form all across Europe. Germany was allied with Italy and with Austria-Hungary. And eventually they allied with the Ottoman, what was left of the Ottoman Empire. Then on the other side, you have Russia, which allied with Serbia. 
and France and Britain allied with Russia. Now, you see Bulgaria was allied with uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary, and it was also kind of slightly supported, at least, by Russia. I don't think they had a formal alliance at this point. So all of the major countries are tied to one group, one side or the other. <coughs> And that's going to become a problem because you've got these two Balkan states here, Serbia and Bulgaria, and that's where the trouble starts. Serbia gained its independence from the, Otto the Ottoman Empire in 1832. You see Serbia is right here. Here's Austria-Hungary up here. And this area down here, Bosnia, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, down to where the Ottoman Empire starts, so this area right here, that's the area known as the Balkans. And stuff was happening there. All, and there's Albania here, and I think that's Montevideo. But I, I didn't mention them, and that doesn't stand for mountain. That's a little teeny tiny country called Montevideo. And that, that's, this is the Balkans right here. And this is the area that is pro the most problematic in Europe. The fact that Serbia became a, an independent nation inspired um, areas of Austria-Hungary that were inhabited by Serbs. So you've got people up in here that are Serbian as well, and they want to try to become independent. And other nationalities that aren't Serbian are going, hey, you know, the Serbs pulled it off. We want to be independent also. <laughs> so there was a series of Balkan wars in the early 1900s where Serbia was inspiring all these nations and um, Austria-Hungary was trying to keep these nations, these, these uh, little pockets of people from becoming independent. And a lot of the time they were also trying to um, capture Serbia and make it part of Austria-Hungary because they were being a problem. And really Austria-Hungary pretty much wanted all of the Balkans. Serbia also wanted more land, and so it was sometimes trying to take some land from uh, the Ottoman Empire, sometimes trying to, you know, gooch a little land from the, the Austria-Hungary Empire. This was a, an area that became known as the powder keg of Europe. Now, think of a powder keg as like a big giant bomb. A, a barrel full of gunpowder. That's what it really refers to. All it's going to take is one spark and the whole thing is going to blow up. That's the area we're talking about when we talk about the Balkans in the early 1900s. A big thing of gunpowder and it's just waiting for a spark. <coughs> the spark happened when the Archduke of, with the Archduke of Franz Ferdinand. He was the son of the Emperor Franz Joseph and the heir to the throne of the Austria-Hungary Empire. This is him right here. He visited Sarajevo, which was a city in Bosnia, which was part of the Austria-Hungarian Hungarian Empire on June the 28th of 1914. He and his wife, Sophie, that's her right there, were riding in an open car as People did, you know, there wasn't this huge um, idea that people had to be protected as much as there is now. They were riding in an open car down the streets of Sarajevo when they were attacked by this man right here. And I hope I said this name anywhere close to right. His name was Gavrilo Princip. He was a member of a group called the Black Hand. Thank you, Scout. Just keep walking. Ugh. He was a member of a group called the Black Hand, and um, they were an a independent, a militant group who wanted Serbia to be to stay independent, and were trying to make sure that Austria-Hungary never got to take over Serbia. Gavrilo Princip was 19 years old when he shot and killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. She died. And almost immediately, uh, the car raced to the nearest hospital, and the Archduke Fr um, Franz Ferdinand died shortly after. I think it was only you know a couple of hours tops that he still lived. Sophie was dead when they got to the hospital. <clears throat> Gavrilo Princip was captured by the crowd. He tried to shoot himself. He failed to do that. 
uh, they would have given him the death penalty, but since he was only 19, they decided to give him 20 years in prison. But he died four years later of tuberculosis because prisons back then were, I mean, prisons now are not great. Prisons back then were horrible. And it was just this big place where you caught lots of diseases and, you know, died. And that's what happened to him. He died four years later and um, of, of tuberculosis. The rest of the world, the rest of Europe, Austria, Hungary, pretty much everybody else, figured that Serbia was behind this assassination. Whether they actually sent this kid out there to shoot this, this Archduke is, has never been proved, but the group was allowed to exist in Serbia. It was a sort of a militant group. <coughs> it was promoting Serbian independence, and so Serbia got blamed. Whether they actually orchestrated this or not, Serbia got blamed. <coughs> Pardon me. So Franz Joseph, Franz Ferdinand's father, is in charge, is the emperor of Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary waited to make sure and talk to Germany first to make sure that, you know what, if we declare war on, on Serbia, are you going to support us? And because Russia supported Bulgaria and Serbia, and Austria-Hungary was not sure they could take Russia on and Serbia at the same time. And so they wanted to make sure that Germany was going to have their backs. Kaiser Wilhelm II gave assurances that Germany would support any actions by Austria-Hungary and go ahead. So on July the 23rd, which is almost a month later, Austria-Hungary issued an ultimatum and a set of demands to Serbia that were basically not doable, stuff that Serbia was not going to agree to. And it was designed to make the Serbians mad enough to push them into a war so that Austria-Hungary wouldn't have to declare war. Serbia would do it. And, you know, they would make the first move. On July the 25th, so just two days later, Serbia rejected the demands and began mobilizing their armies. Austria-Hungary decided this was a hostile act and they declared war on Serbia. So this is when everything starts going into, all these alliances start coming into play. Since Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia on July the 28th of 1914, then Germany entered the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. Well, that triggers Russia. Russia enters the war on the side of Serbia. And then that triggers France and England, and they entered the war on the side of Russia. Italy entered the war on the side of Germany, but later on they switched sides and came in on the side of um, England and France and Russia. The U.S. stays aside and kind of is like, that's their war in Europe, that's not our problem. We're just gonna stay over here and we're gonna be neutral. But most of the major countries at this point have been triggered into reacting to this situation, which should have been a regional conflict, you know, because it, it involved, basically it only really involved Serbia and Austro-Hungary. But it blows up and becomes a huge world war. We'll talk another time about how the U.S. got into the war and then how the war goes from there. All right. So that's really all I have for you today. I was trying to keep it a little bit short so that these are small. Because if, if we talk about all of the reasons of World War I starting, it's going to take about an hour and a half and nobody has time to watch that. So that's all I have for you this time. Um, sorry, Bass is over there making weird noises over at the food bowl. Don't know what's going on there. That's all I have for you this time. If you have any comments, let me know. Uh, like and share, all that good stuff. I will see you the next time. Thank you. Okay, Sully, I think we're done. <laughs>